Late Life is a production of Twin Cities Public Television in partnership with Alina Health, whose Life Course Project, funded by the Robina Foundation, granted the producers unique access to their ongoing research into late life care in Minnesota. Heart disease is the most common cause of death in our society, but also it is an extremely common cause of what's called heart failure or deterioration in heart function. And so they did all these tests and that's when the lady came back and told me I had congested heart failure. Heart failure is really an umbrella term. It, it covers a lot of different conditions. Couldn't even make it a half a block without getting out of breath. We're gonna make sure we monitor the lungs. So we can always talk to the doctor about increasing your diuretic. There's a lot of things that people can do to prevent this condition. There's also a lot of things they can do to help themselves when they have this condition. You know, I just kept fighting, trying to do right, trying to eat right and stuff like that. Sometimes it is something that can be managed really well with medications. Most patients whose hearts don't work properly actually can do very well with medical treatment on the other hand, these patients may, in fact, have a very poor prognosis over time. As my doctor reminded me, you may be feeling all right now, but you are terminally ill. We want people to live as long as they can live once we know that they have a life-limiting disease, um, but we want them to live the best that they can live. One in four deaths in the United States are caused by heart disease. Often the symptom of underlying causes, heart disease can lead to other issues, and its severity and proper treatment vary from person to person. Advancements in medicine and technology have found ways to manage heart disease and extend lifespans. But now the healthcare industry is broadening its focus to include seeing the patient and those who support them as whole persons not simply a diagnosis. And how to determine when the focus should change from extending life to making the end of life as comfortable as possible. This program will explore the stories of people living well and dying well with heart disease. On most afternoons, you'll find Linda Stone walking for exercise around her apartment building. Born and raised in Grenada, Mississippi, Linda has lived here in Minneapolis since 1972. I moved here right out of high school. I was married 20 years. My husband's name was Anthony. I got two kids, Anthony Jr. and Tara is my daughter. And my husband passed away three years after our 20 year anniversary. Widowed with two children, Linda worked as a personal care assistant, taking care of the sick and elderly in their homes. In the late 90s, Linda returned to Mississippi to take care of her parents, both sick with cancer. I was staying there taking care of them and not taking care of myself. Ended up putting on a whole bunch of weight and stuff. When they uh, passed away, I noticed I was getting sick. And uh, so my kids called me, they lived up here, they wanted me to come back. When I got to my daughter's house, I was feeling real dizzy. I asked her to take me to the hospital. They had told me I had congested heart failure. And so I was just in and out of the hospital probably for the next year or so, trying to get straight myself. There's a lot of different things that can lead to heart failure, but the two biggest and the two most common are the heart failure with reduced heart function, so the pumping, squeezing capacity is reduced, and then the other is the relaxation abnormality. And again, high blood pressure is really a big, big component of, of that. So long-standing hypertension is a really significant cause of heart failure down the road. Well, just imagine that vasculature also goes to your brain, it goes to your kidneys, it goes to your legs. I couldn't walk because I had neuropathy in my legs so bad. And obviously on top of all of that is diabetes, which is in itself a risk factor for vascular disease. My sugar was 1164. 
they couldn't believe it. They said, you walked in here? I said, yes, I, I walked in. Heart failure is really a constellation of symptoms, and that is shortness of breath, often edema, so buildup of fluid in the legs, reduced capacity to, to do things. The big underlying commonality is there's a mismatch between what the heart can do versus what you're asking it to do. So it's not that it's failed or, or that it's completely destroyed or anything, it's just that it can't keep up. It was pretty bad. We were going to hospital visits all the time and she was staying overnight because of this or that or complications with this or that. And I, for me, it was more about how do we get it stable? I think I was on 18 pills a day. I was on 18. It is a chronic disease and, and we have many things that we can do to keep it in, in check unless you don't address the drivers. So if you have heart failure because you had high blood pressure, we can get rid of the fluid in your legs, but if we don't control your blood pressure, well, that's not gonna last for very long, right? So, so it's really about addressing the underlying cause, which is the chronic issue. I was real hard-headed, and hard-headed just got me in the hospital. So I said, well, I, I gotta make a choice here. Either I'm gonna live or die. So I start changing my eating habits. We've made nutrition very complicated because we're so focused on these numbers, but really it's basic principles. Eat real food. Eat the least processed food you can still enjoy. And, and that's the, the secret. Favor plants over, over animal-based products. I hated spinach. I hated a lot of vegetables. I hated broccoli. And now I love all that stuff because it's helping me. Had me to read labels because I never knew that much salt was in processed food. I didn't know it because I was buying soup and I thought the soup was good. Sodium is in everything. Unless you cook for yourself from scratch, the chances that what you're eating is going to be high in salt content is enormous. She printed me off, I think it was two sheets about not eating. And that's well, can I get a sheet on what I can eat? The best way to reduce your sodium without getting, you know, all hung up on the labels, add in things you know are low salt. Beans and greens, nuts and seeds, right? It's all vegetables, it's all fruits, right? It's, you know, all those things. If you're eating all those years this way, and then all of a sudden one day they tell you, you know, you can't do this, that's not easy. Yep, they had that. Uh, I had to learn how to eat all over again. While Linda was making dramatic changes in her eating habits, her son Anthony learned that his diet was sending him down the same destructive path that she had been on. The funny thing about it is that as I was starting to think about these changes, I ended up coming down with diabetes myself. I ended up going to the doctor and he said, look, here's your options. You can continue on this path of destructive eating and you'll be dead within five to 10 years tops. You see the ramifications of whatever the behavior is in your parents, and you want to do something different for yourself. You try to at least create new habits, and that's not easy. Because of the changes that I learned by watching some of the things that she's done, our whole eating style at my home was totally different. So far to date, I've basically lost over 105 pounds or so. My diabetes now is under control and you know I don't have to take the insulin or the pills or anything like that. So I was so proud of him and I'm really still proud of him now. Beyond diet, many heart patients discover that exercise can greatly help slow their disease's progression. Start walking when I got where I could walk. I started out with a half a block, then I got back up to my block. Ideally, you do something every single day, and ideally it's moderate. And if you can do something for a half hour or even an hour, that's terrific. Patients with advanced heart failure, they may not be able to go for an hour-long walk. That's okay. Do what you can. That's what breaking a generational cycle looks like, you know, not accepting that. I have diabetes, I have congestive heart failure, my, my life ends, but let me do something about it. There's lots of things that patients need to do for themselves. It's not just simply you come to doctor and you say, well, doctor, fix me. I would like to see my kids, my grandkids, and my great-grandkids, and great-great if I have to, if I can, 
But yeah, but it is it's wonderful. And like I said, I feel better. I feel so much better. For many patients, the diagnosis, medical treatments, and subsequent lifestyle changes brought on by heart disease can seem overwhelming. There are, however, community organizations that can ease the transition. Knock, knock. Can I come in? What we see on this floor mostly is our post-bypass patients. So people who've had open heart surgery generally come to this floor to get their aftercare. Mended Hearts is a national organization of volunteers who have all had major heart events in their own life. We come to the hospital to uh, visit with patients and we visit with uh, families of patients who are having heart surgery. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. It's come Monday, I had to come into emergency. My visit today was with a um, patient who is going through congestive heart failure. It's just been kind of an ongoing thing. I didn't take care of myself, and, and that's what happens when you, <laughs> you let it go, you know, so. A lot of our patients go through something that we call the cardiac blues. They were out mowing the lawn one day, and the next thing you know, they were having chest pain, and here they've had a quadruple bypass, and it's life changing. And the staff do their best to talk with the patients and connect with them, but the mended hearts, they come in and they instill hope at a different level because they've walked in their shoes. They can say, hey, I've been in the same position. I have the same scar as you. I've, and I just did nine holes of golf. When I was in cardiac rehab, we called ourselves, oh, the group of us that were together, we called ourselves the zipper club. No one else could call us that, but we can call ourselves that. And so I started thinking about it, that it's a club that we never wanted to join. Went through open heart surgery, oh, yes. and I went through cardiac rehab. Well, you look pretty good for that, <laughs> going through all it. <laughs> it's been a while ago now. <laughs> Doctors are way above your head in, in a lot of ways, too, you know. Um, it's nice to be able to talk to somebody that's had it done, and then you get more information about it. I can tell them everything, and I can tell them what's going to happen, explain it. We have a great nursing program that does the same thing. We have videos. But when you actually see that person who's been through it, and you can say, yes, I, you know, I am going to be okay, that really decreases people's anxiety and lets them know they're going to be okay, and I can get through this. You're a caring bunch, you are. We, we <laughs> uh, feel we can empathize with you. Mm -hmm. Your family can sympathize with you. Yeah. But... We can empathize with you. Oh, that's great. Sometimes um, you can literally just see they're relaxed, and that can have physiological effects so, as well. It can decrease their heart rate, it can decrease their pain, anxiety, just to give them an opportunity to be able to talk to somebody. They're coming in as some, somewhat of a friend. Have they ever talked about shopping on the outside of the grocery store and avoiding the inside? Do you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, they did. Patients just yeah. open up to them yeah. naturally and we see a difference and we thank them when they leave. Thank you so much for taking the time and you know, it makes our job easier too. If the patients are doing better, then we feel better and we feel like we're doing a good job and it's a great program. I'm, I'm gonna be one of the people that'll bug other people to straighten up and do it right, right or otherwise you'll be right, right back in here again. And I don't plan to be back in here again. <laughs> In 2002, I had bypass surgery, uh, five bypasses. Things went fine for quite a few years, and then about three years ago, um, suddenly things went wrong. And um, he went into cardiac and kidney failure, and we thought we were going to lose him. I would fill up with fluid. If the right side of the heart starts to fail, then we get fluid buildup in our legs lower extremities, and in our belly. I got like I was eight months pregnant. <laughs> when the heart doesn't pump properly, the fluid actually backs up into the lungs. We've done everything that can be done for him, and, uh, and he feels the same way. As treatment of chronic disease becomes more involved and lifespans increase, patients and their families can feel overwhelmed from multiple specialist visits and numerous medications to financial, spiritual, and emotional stress. Persons with serious illness in their families can fall through the cracks. 
In an attempt to address this, Alina Health began a multi-year study called Life Course. Life Course is an innovative approach to supporting patients and families who are in their last few years of life. So folks who may have advanced heart failure, they may have advanced cancer, advanced dementia, COPD, Parkinson's, um, any of a number of conditions. Healthcare does a really nice job of taking care of folks when they're in the hospital. And then we do really good when folks get very near the end of life. What we don't do is well in between. What can be months, what can be years of time that a patient and family will face, struggle with, be overwhelmed by advanced serious illness. And we have created these, while tremendous, healthcare institutions that do amazing thing for individuals. They are remarkably complicated, layered on top of remarkably complicated advanced serious illness. And to, on some level, abandon folks during that long period, I think it's something that we can no longer do. How are things been going? Well, pretty well. Pretty well? Pretty well. I'm... We use in the life course model a lay healthcare worker who has likely life experience supporting someone with really advanced serious illness, but isn't a trained clinician. We call them care guides, uh, and their job really is to partner with them in navigating the system, in navigating the other systems that they may need to intersect with, so not just healthcare, but social service systems and some of the other social assets. They joined almost two years ago, and then we started meeting, and as I look back, it was monthly. Is your energy starting to go down a little more, do you think? I think it's beginning to fade a bit. We talk about both medical and non-medical concerns in my visits. She's kept in close touch with us and referred us to people that we needed to be referred to. She's been a real resource person for us. She listens to me. <laughs> I talk and she listens. When patients talk about what matters most to them, uh, what ends up showing up Less than the majority of the time are their physical health needs. So beginning to understand that 70% of the time, it's about all of the other aspects of self. We engineer a lot of the care that we provide in the system currently towards physical health, towards that piece. Um, and we don't ask about those other pieces, nor have we thoughtfully stepped into how to actually support patients and families in different ways. And so this has given us a way to ask about that, to be able to capture it in the record, and then to be able to, with patients and families, develop that plan. Too, what you've helped me do is write a story that's now in your medical chart yeah. that includes those details that haven't yeah. been there in the past. What we really are trying to do with Care Guide partnering with an individual and their friends and family members is to engage in an empowerment model, to be clear about what matters most, and then to really enable them to engage their primary care team members, their specialty care team members, but more importantly, all of those supports that exist outside of a healthcare system that they're gonna need in those you know, last several years. They confide in us, uh, see us as someone they can trust to share some of their thoughts at the end of their lives. So staying with them through hospice, we become a caring friend. I came to grips with my mortality a year ago, February. There's a continuity um, in relationship that seems to be really important to our patients. But I'm still there even when you know, they've transitioned into another level of care. And back in February of 2014, doctor came in and said, you've got two leaky valves. There's no way we can stop this buildup of fluids. Your life expectancy is not very good. Then he said, would you rather die in the hospital or at home? That's when it hit me. <laughs> That's when it hit me. People think, oh, if I go in hospice, I have to leave my house. But you don't. We go to a nursing home, assisted living facility, um, a home, an apartment. It doesn't matter where you are. So in May, we started with hospice. And they have been lifesavers. How's the fluid been in your legs? In my legs? Mm -hmm. We spend our whole lives trying to find cures for things if we're sick. And there comes a point in time where we know that you can keep pursuing a lot of aggressive treatments, but the end result is that it exhausts you. You spend all your energy 96 .1 trying to find a way to live longer instead of a way to live better. 
Your oxygen's great. It's 97% in your heartbeat. There's no need for Bob to go back to the doctor ever if there's symptoms. I can call and get meds changed right here, and the meds come right to the door. I could call him at any time, day or night, and uh, that's been a real, a real help to me. Even though I'm a nurse, he's my husband. <laughs> and, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Medically speaking, what's helped him live as long as he has is that he's had the ability to have this treatment done at home. And I'd had friends who, say, who had said that, oh, don't go with hospice. You could live a lot longer if you keep going to the doctor. And of course, that was proven wrong with us. Uh, my doctor said probably if he wouldn't have had hospice but would have kept going to doctors, he probably wouldn't still be with us. By the first part of August, I was feeling good. He just got better and better and better. In fact, we asked hospice if we could go back to the doctor to have some cardiac tests done to find out why he was doing so well. And they let us do that. And everything, all of his heart functions and everything had just improved. What to me, the best part of what we get to do in, in hospice is we get to provide body, mind, spirit, and family-centered care. And I keep saying, well, I know what did it, <laughs> hospice and prayer. Um, I had at least a hundred people praying for me, <laughs> at least a hundred. <laughs> when treating serious illness, the healthcare system has learned much about the physical needs of patients. But spiritual well-being is something that each individual can seek for themselves. I read the word my Bible a lot, and we got a good Bible class on Friday night. And in the Bible it says, if you don't forgive, it turns into other things, like sickness. And I know that I had a lot of animosity in my heart, I didn't know I had it there. But when I learned, I just asked God, you know, just to forgive me. Whatever I got, he knows what's in my heart. She really um, loves the Lord and is a strong person of faith. And it works because I'm a living witness that it works. And it's so important. We have to take care of our soul, not just our body, but our soul. What you bring to the situation in terms of your own personal outlook makes a world of difference. I mean, people who are positive, who can find the, the good in you know what happened today, they do so much better. They do so much better long term. There's a lot uh, beyond um, medicine, and I think it has to do with um, either our spiritual or, or other, or other uh, well-being uh, that actually goes beyond traditional medicine. I think it's very important that, that people have hope. If you don't have hope, the odds that the treatment regimen is going to work is diminished. So you have to be very careful that you're not dispelling hope. But yet recognizing the reality of the situation that, that we can't fix all things and that there, there is a time for more end-of-life discussions. A time to be born and a time to die. Be prepared as much as you can be prepared. You know, make sure that you have your wishes known. Make sure that you have your living will, your advance directives, your health care power of attorney, all those things set so that those worries, you know, are, are off the table. It's done. I feel like God knew the day I was born and he knows the day I'm going to die. And so it's in his hands. And I'll live day to day as best I can. I think he's taught me a lot about how to approach a serious illness um, with, with hope. By coming to grips with death, uh, I found peace. And that's, that's available to anyone. You get the diagnosis of your heart is failing. You got kidney issues and high blood pressure and diabetes and all this stuff. Yeah, people would naturally say, well, it's over for me. She didn't do that. She made a decision, and she stuck with it, and she's here and living and doing well. 
It wasn't easy, I'll say that. It wasn't, but you no, know, I thank God that he brought me back. And I just want to live the rest of my life out knowing my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids, if that be the case. It's about living well and ultimately dying well as well. And he's doing, he's living. There's one thing Bob does every night that makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> See if I can do this. Um, every night when we go to bed, he says, another, we've had another good day. We've had another good day and I love you very much. So that makes it all worthwhile. The last project Bob completed is a book chronicling the last several years of his life and his thoughts on death called How To Live Well and Finish Right. It includes a dedication to Judith Blomberg, his life course care guide. Late Life is a production of Twin Cities Public Television in partnership with Alina Health, whose Life Course project, funded by the Robina Foundation, granted the producers unique access to their ongoing research into late life care in Minnesota.